What's up guys, Alec on Curie here, and welcome to the Not Natty Speed and Agility Vlog. And like I showed you guys in the intro, I can run faster than a speeding car, or at least a slow moving car. In all seriousness, though, on my last run of the day here, this car came in right behind me, so I thought it would be pretty neat to superimpose the two clips together just to give you guys a better idea of how I'm actually moving, since I'm usually just running by myself out here, and there's nothing really relative for you guys to compare it to. So hopefully you thought that was cool. I thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, I kicked the session off with flying sprints here. And honestly, I'm not really doing anything pretty crazy in this session. I'm not even really pushing it to maximum gear here. Mostly, I'm just trying to run relaxed, push it to about 95% or so of, of, of my maximum perceived exertion, and really just stay as relaxed as possible while I do that and gain as much speed as possible, essentially with as little perceived effort as possible. And then a few days after I did this session, I went out again, and in that session, I actually pushed it to maximum speed, and the differences were pretty interesting, according to the clock. So for here, for example, like I said, I'm, I'm really not pushing it very hard and I'm not accelerating very hard at all. And when I don't accelerate maximally, that seems to put a pretty hard cap on what my top end speed ends up being according to the free lap timer, even when I feel like I had hit pretty close to top speed. Whereas when I accelerate hard from the onset of the sprint, when I accelerate as hard as I can, my top speed actually seems to have a much higher ceiling. But those sessions are a lot more stressful also because I'm, I'm running about 60 to 70 yards total on each of these flying sprints with the run up and the fly zone included. So when I push it to maximum speed for four, five, or maybe even six sprints, that ends up being quite a lot of high intensity work. What you think? Not too bad, not perfect, but not too bad. I'll time it by hand, we'll see what it is. Anyway, I was mostly using those relaxed sprints just as a way to prime the nervous system here and get nice and loose and warm so that I could run some solid shuttle drills. And I used to play a lot of tennis and a lot of football and a lot of basketball when I was younger. So cutting and breaking hard and sharp have always come very natural to me. And I've always been very agile because of that. Now, as I've gotten older, I've stopped participating in sports as much, but I don't want to lose that edge, that agility, right? And, and agility and linear speed are completely different things. I've mostly been doing linear speed work lately, but when you don't maintain that capacity, the capacity to stop on a dime and break out of a cut hard, those qualities do start to suffer. I'm 33 now, approaching 34, and I'd like to remain quick and agile as I age and eclipse the big 4-0. So I think incorporating more stuff like this more frequently is going to be a really good idea for, idea for me. And, and I find these drills super fun to do anyway, and racing against the clock motivates the hell out of me. So this is just a good way for me to stay sharp. And my best ever time on this drill on the 60-yard shuttle is right around 10.9 seconds, just under 11 seconds, but that was done on grass and, and well, while wearing cleats. I can't cut quite as hard out here on the concrete without slipping, so I, I'm having to take more baby steps here to gather myself before I cut, which does slow me down. But on the final run here, I did try to push it pretty hard, and I ended up right around 11.3 or 2 seconds, something like that, in the low 11 seconds, which really isn't too bad considering that it's being done on concrete and that I have not run like this in several years. So I'm pretty happy with that for the first time back and I'm going to set the goal of trying to go sub 11 right here in the driveway on the 60 yard shuttle. That may be a lofty goal but at least it'll give me something to shoot for. And then after the sprint work I moved on to the weights and I started off with a hang power snatch sequence which Literally, I think it took me just about 15 minutes total to complete from the time I got everything set up to the time I threw 205 pounds over my head. I was resting maybe 30 to 60 seconds in between lifts, really just enough time to load the bar, chalk up, set the lift up and go. And, and I went from the empty bar up to a pretty easy single with 205 pounds in those 15 minutes. So that's pretty cool. I've got really good power there. I think that may be the highest that I've ever pulled 205 into a power snatch, to be honest. I mean, I barely had to even dip under the damn thing. So that's pretty strong. And we'll see 
if maybe I can match my PR of 225 sometime soon on this lift, but hopefully do it better than I did last time. The first time I ever did it, it was actually pretty iffy. Or perhaps if I'm feeling strong, maybe I'll be able to take a stab at 230, 230 pounds from the pocket like this heaved into a power catch position overhead would be pretty badass in my opinion. So we'll see if I can work my way up to it. Anyway, after the power snatches, I moved on to the final phase of the workout, the traditional strength and hypertrophy work. And I'm alternating sets here between a hip hinge and a glute biased hip extension movement. So the emphasis here obviously is pretty heavy on the posterior chain, the glutes, hammies, and the low back. And for my hinge, I'm currently using the barbell loaded hyper extension. You can see I've got the hyper bench stuck inside the squat rack here so that I can position myself on the 45 degree hyper and, and safely unrack the heavy-ish weight onto my back. And from there, when I finish up the set, I've decided that it's easier to honestly just dump the bar over my head and back onto the floor and then power clean it back up into the rack for the next set rather than trying to lean all the way back to set the bar onto the pins of the squat rack. It's a lightweight for power clean purposes, so it doesn't really matter anyway. And overall, the setup here works really well for this and, and that I've got, and this loading method is honestly incredible for this exercise compared to some of the other ones that I've showed you guys in the past. For reference, I have held 250 pounds in a static row position out in front of me and done eight solid reps that way on the exercise, but here, on the hyper extension. But here, on the last set, I worked up to just 135 pounds for a set of 10 reps, and I barely even completed 10 reps. And on that set, the muscle activation in the glutes and the hamstrings and the lower back far, far surpassed what I felt when I did the set with 250 pounds just last year. And that's basically with half as much weight as I was using then. So that's pretty crazy. And I have to say, I, I do think that if you can swing it, this is the king of all hyperextension variations, the barbell loaded version like I'm doing in this video. Everything else honestly just kind of pales in comparison to that, but it can be somewhat cumbersome to set up unless you have a partner to put the bar on your back for you. And if you don't, like I don't, then I would recommend being very careful because it can be very dangerous. It would be very dangerous to try to put the bar on your back first and then try to lay down on the hyperextension bench, which is why I started putting it in the squat rack instead. Now for my glute exercise, I'm doing the single leg hip thrust at this point. I started doing it this way maybe just two or three weeks ago, whereas before that I had been doing the bilateral version for months since the beginning of 2021. I had been doing bilateral hip thrust and I ended that that little experiment with 285 pounds for three sets of 15 reps pretty comfortably. I could have kept going, but I just needed a mental change mostly. And, and so I decided it was time to give the single leg version a go. And it hasn't disappointed me so far. Even with just the empty bar, this is quite a different experience. It's very challenging in its own right. And I can feel that the glute medius is having to work considerably harder here as compared to the two leg version, which makes sense as the pelvis needs to be kept level and stable here since you're on one leg. And so by the time that I get to the end here, the third set, the last set, honestly, I'm pretty well spent. It was, I didn't want, I didn't want anything to do with that last set. And it was tough to get full hip extension there. But overall, I think I did a pretty good job and I'll probably keep the empty bar for a couple more weeks. And then I'll make just a five pound jump and I'll work my way up slowly from there. And then once I wrapped up the last set of hip thrusts, I decided to give my back and hammies a quick stretch with the empty bar in my hand. So just a light load here, but that can make a pretty big difference in how big of a stretch that you're able to get. And I've shown you guys that I can go palms flat onto the floor with no extra weight in my hands. But with the bar here, just 45 pounds, I'm able to take that a, a decent bit further thanks to the extra weight pulling me down. And note that I've got a pretty wide grip on the bar here as I do this. So I'm actually moving the hamstrings in the back through quite a large range of motion in order to reach down and rest my hands onto the floor. So that was nice. It, it felt good to get a good stretch in there in those muscles after trashing them pretty hard with the hypers and the hip thrusts. And I'm going to keep working on my mobility, keep working on my power and my explosiveness, my agility and my speed and all that good stuff. I just got a safety squat bar a couple weeks ago and I've started having some fun with that on box squats. And so training is fun. It's going well right now and I will keep you guys posted on how it progresses.